My name is Steven Valeri. I am a smart contract dev at the Ave companies. I've um, been there for about a year and a half, have worked on um, some things like our uh, cross-chain governance bridge, our V3 deployment, and most recently, uh, have been spending time working on uh, our stablecoin project, Go. Um, and I'm really excited to tell you guys all about that. Um, but before I get into Go, I uh, kind of want to take a step back and walk through um, the current stablecoin landscape. Um, and in doing that, I think that will give some helpful context as to you know, what is Go and how it fits into um, that broader ecosystem. Um, and I don't know if I, who else was here for the previous talk, um, but it was a great talk about Rye, which is a stable coin. Um, and I think it perfectly kind of highlights why understanding the landscape is important, because what the heck is a stable coin? There's so many things that fall under this definition um, that it creates confusion, it creates risk, um, and you know, just saying that you're working with a stable coin isn't sufficient to understand what the heck type of asset you're working with. Um, so let's try to answer some basic questions around stable coins, and I think we'll pretty quickly identify uh, why it's so challenging to you know, understand what people are talking about. Um, so what is a stable coin? Um, I think at the broadest level, you could say a stable coin is an asset that attempts to maintain a stable price. Um, I think very commonly we're seeing pegged stable coins. Um, so they're pegged to um, some other assets value. Uh, most commonly, I think, and most dominant in the market is US dollar pegged stable coins. Um, but we're also starting to see stable coins that are pegged to other FX uh, tokens. Um, and there's also tokens that just aren't pegged. So again, Rai as an example. Um, it's a stable coin, but it's not pegged to a specific price. Um, so it's a, a token that aims to have less volatility. Um, but I think generally at this point, if someone were to say, yeah, I traded into a bunch of stables, you would probably assume that they're talking about a US dollar pegged stable so, coin. So uh, how does a stable coin work? We answered one question of what is a stable coin, and I think here at a second question, it's pretty obvious that there's not really a straightforward answer. It depends. It's totally different depending on the type of asset that you're working with. Um, and you know, this creates some challenges and presents risks. Right? If you just assume that the token that you're using is in fact stable, um, you know, and without understanding how the underlying stability mechanism works or other risks that are present in that asset, um, you, know, you may be taking on far more risk in your portfolio um, or whatever you're trying to do than you're intending. Um, so, yeah, again, just these things are so different. You can't compare apples and oranges um, you know, to the you know, users here who know what DAI and USDC are. If you were to ask them, you know, are these the same? People would be like, no, very different. Um, and I thought this analogy played very well, and I've just realized that I'm going to, in fact, be comparing stable coins throughout this presentation. So maybe not the best analogy. Um, so let's take a look at the current landscape. Um, as you can see here, the one-to-one -one backed centralized stable coins are totally dominant. Uh, you can see Tether, USDC, BUSD um, are in the tens of billions in terms of market cap, um, just kind of totally far and away dominant. Um, next in line is DAI. So DAI is a decentralized, over-collateralized cryptocurrency backed stable coin. Um, and that's really the, the next leader in the pack, um, and definitely the leader in the pack in terms of this type of asset. Um, you know, there, are other types, uh, there are other assets in this category, um, like MIM, Magic Internet Money, uh, and then Go, uh, Aave's uh, native stablecoin, which we're um, developing, will fit into this category as well. Um, also here, there's other stablecoins that have uh, much smaller market caps, but are using new stability mechanisms, things like FRAX, things like RIE, which we'll talk about as well. Um, and these things are just so different um, that you know, even having them in the same category presents challenges in talking about them and comparing them um, you know, and trying to use them for the same purpose. Um, so 
one other thing I'd like to call out here, and I think that's probably the biggest um, example of why this stuff is important, um, is an asset that's not included here, which is uh, UST. So the stable coin associated with the Terra project, um, it was approximately $18 billion worth of value at its top market cap. Um, that has essentially disappeared, right? And that is comprised of users and people you know, not really double clicking into what is this stable coin, how does it work, what are the risks, how does it compare to other stable coins. Um, so I, you know, I think that's kind of the ultimate example of why we're even having this conversation around, you know, well, what really is a stable coin? We talked about those top three. Um, they're one type of stable coin, which is a centralized one-to-one -one backed stable coin. Uh, examples are USDC, USDT, BUSDT, D, true USD. Uh, in this case, they are generally uh, assets in which you trust a centralized institution to custody, uh, in the case of a US dollar peg stable coin, one US dollar per each stable coin that they mint or issue. Um, there's caveats around this though, right? You're trusting them to uh, maybe hold about one uh, dollar's worth of assets in their reserve for each thing that they mint. Uh, and you're, you're also in some cases trusting them to hold about one dollar's worth of US dollar equivalents. Um, so again, you know, per each of these institutions, um, and their processes and how they work, it, you know, kind of double clicking into what this asset's actually backed by. Is it one to one? What are they doing? Are they using treasuries? Um, is important. Um, so here we can highlight some of the risks of working with an asset like this. Um, you know, obviously, it being centralized is to some extent counter to the general decentralized ethos of blockchain environments. Um, and in having this trusted entity, um, we take on risk, right? We're trusting this entity to be managing their reserves appropriately, right? Like they aren't just investing all of that reserves into risky assets. Um, so that's very important. Uh, to mitigate this, some companies are um, using audit firms. So Center with Circle, uh, they hire Grant Thornton, top five accounting firm in the world to publish uh, reports to give users confidence that they have reserves of US dollars, US dollar equivalents that are equal to or more than the amount of value they've issued on chains. Um, another risk you're taking with this trusted entity is just generally, um, you know, how do they function as a business? You could think of things like IT security, right? Who has access within their systems to make transfers for their reserves? This is something you know, kind of basic, but very important. Um, you know, and then IT security specific to Web3. Who has access and how do they manage their wallets that can make really important transactions uh, or freeze users? Oh, one other point on the um, reserve ecosystem and you know, getting confidence that these reserves are backed. Um, True USD, instead of having an auditor, has introduced an or a solution with Chainlink called Proof of Reserves, in which they have oracles that report the status of all of their accounts. Um, so by doing that, the system can never mint uh, more than you know, the reserves th that they have. Um, so that's another interesting solution and in, you know, attempt to give users confidence that these assets are in fact backed and redeemable. Um, another risk here in trusting this institution and entity is that uh, these, these stable coins often have the ability to freeze uh, an address, or it could also be a pool, um, and in doing that, you know, you could potentially lose access to your funds um, at the discretion of these institutions. Um, you know, of course, there are times when this makes sense, right? In the most recent BNB hack, um, Tether was quite early to uh, freezing the hackers' funds. Uh, but you know, you're dependent on this institution making the appropriate decisions in the future, which. Um, you, know, you might be hesitant to do. So the next type, uh, decentralized, over-collateralized, crypto-backed stable coins. Um, the most obvious example of this is DAI. There's also magic internet money. Um, each of these uh, tokens gets minted. That's minted is backed by uh, crypto collateral. This can be you know, Ethereum, Bitcoin, um, other one-to-one stable coins. Um, and when they 
in order to mint them, you need to deposit your collateral to a smart contract. So this is a clear difference from the previous example. Um, this smart contract is on chain. You can clearly see and have confidence that the smart contract holds enough assets to collateralize the stable coin which has been minted. Um, you also have confidence around the rules in which the system works. The, the, it's controlled by a smart contract, um, which uh, is open source software, right? You can see the code, you know how the reserves will be handled. So you, know, you have confidence around um, how that will work. Um, in addition to the smart contract, in some cases, you have certain parameters within the system that can be configurable, um, or it could, in fact, be an immutable smart contract. So once the system's deployed, there's no configurations to change. Uh, I think more commonly, most of these systems have a few configuration variables, at least. Um, and these are often set by DAOs, which is a decentralized set of token holders, um, hopefully incentivized to uh, maintain the stable coins peg. Um, and this encourages and, and helps uh, de-risk the fact that, and, and not be dependent on one single entity uh, for the stability of the system. That being said, these also have a lot of risks. Um, you know, just because you move away from some of those centralized concerns, um, there's still risks uh, with this different type of asset. Um, so first of all, there's the stability mechanism. How does this token maintain its peg? Um, so some common ways in which this is done uh, is an oracle within the system that's responsible for telling the system how much this stable coin is worth gets pegged to $1. Um, and that's regardless of whether the market price is you know, above $1, less than $1. Um, and by doing that, it creates arbitrage opportunities in which, uh, which helps stabilize the um, token, and if we have time later, we'll talk through some examples of that. Um, additionally, interest rates can be used. So you can uh, help manage the supply of the asset based on interest rates. With high interest rates, people will be paying back their positions, which will decrease the supply, impacting the price. Same with low interest rates. If you have low interest rates, more people will be uh, interested in taking out positions, increasing the supply, again, impacting price. Um, another risk here is the collateral that's being used for this decentralized cryptocurrency-backed stablecoin. The stability of the token and you know, its collateral is dependent on the value of its collateral. So if a, um, in some cases, those, all the risks of the collateral come through uh, and are present within the stablecoin. So for example, we said we've de-risked these types of coins by removing the centralized entity and how the system is controlled. Um, but that being said, while there's collateral um, that backs a decentralized stablecoin, um, which is a one-to-one -one centralized stablecoin, um, you know, you're still exposed to those risks of how that centralized entity is managing um, their stablecoin. Um, additionally, you generally don't want volatile assets um, you would like uh, assets that are um, relatively stable uh, in order to minimize the amount of liquidations that are required and reduce the possibility of having under collateralized positions within the system. Um, I think that gets to flash crashes. Um, again, around the price of your stablecoin, when you have an over collateralized stablecoin, you need the collateral to be worth more than. Um, your, uh, the amount that you have minted. Uh, over time, generally, if assets, if the price of assets decreases uh, that are your collateral, that's okay. There's liquidation processes in place in which someone can come, they'll pay off your debt, and they get your collateral. Um, and the collateral is worth more than your debt, so they make out a little bit of extra money. Um, really, where a risk comes into play is if pr the price of your asset crashes, the collateral asset crashes so quickly that liquidators do not have time to perform those liquidations. Um, in that case, you result in under collateralized positions, which likely result in uh, a DPEG of your coin. Um, again, we talked about, you know, there's different aspects of um, these protocols that are configurable. So making sure that A, it's configured appropriately, and the, per the person or the entity or DAO who is configuring them 
is knowledgeable in the space uh, and is making informed decisions is, imp is important. Um, and then finally, there's smart contract risk, right? There's always a risk that there's gonna be a bug in the code. Um, you can do as much as you can to try to eliminate and mitigate this risk from responsible development practices internally, um, internal reviews, uh, external audits, um, which I think we see throughout the space. Um, yeah, so you, know, you can do as much as you can to try to reduce the risk of smart contract bugs, but um, at the end of the day, they'll exist in the space. So briefly, other types of stable coins. Uh, I think we already can see there's a huge difference between one-to-one -one backed centralized stable coins, decentralized over collateralized stable coins, um, and now a couple of others that I hesitate to even try to name what type they are because they're so different uh, and function you know, very interestingly. Um, so one is Frax. Frax is a stable coin that is partially backed by collateral um, and then also partially maintains its stability through algorithmically. Yep. Obviously, that's quite different than a DAI or USDC. Um, or you could look at RAI, which is a stable coin that is not pegged to any specific asset. Uh, and its stability mechanism works through understanding the redemption rate. So how often are people taking out positions? How often are people repaying their positions? And based on the rate under which that is occurring, the price of the asset will slowly vary one way or the other. Um, and you know, this isn't to give you, you know, a full understanding of what these systems are and how they work, but it's to say these are totally different types of assets that we're talking about in the same category of stable coins. And you know, now if you go to think about stable coins or work with a stable coin, you should say, you know, what is the stability mechanism? How does this actually work? Is it pegged? Is it not pegged? It's more to you know, kind of promote that thinking of you know, what, what are the risks of this coin? Um, and is it actually going to maintain its stability? Cool. Um, so now I get to talk a little bit about Go, um, which falls into that category of decentralized, over-collateralized, crypto-backed uh, stable coins, and um, it will fit natively into the Aave market. Um, so one thing we recognized at Aave, looking at our existing liquidity pool uh, protocol, was that there's a lot of functionality in our general market that would be required for this type of stable coin. Um, you know, things like depositing collateral, things like liquidation processes, these things exist within the Aave protocol um, and also are exactly what you need to facilitate a decentralized stable coin. Um, so I think that's something that's really nice even on the development side is that um, Go fits into the existing Aave market. Um, so a lot of the processes and you know, ways that you will interact with it should be very familiar to um, interacting with Go. It's really a new custom asset that's getting added to the market. Um, so you know, while there are differences in the implementation, and we'll go through those you know, in some detail, um, at a high level, when you go to interact with Aave and borrow Go, uh, it's pretty much the same as borrowing another asset. You deposit your collateral, you borrow, go, uh, you hold it for some amount of time, it accrues interest, and eventually you pay it back. So that's pretty much the same process as any other asset. Um, that being said, when it gets added, the way that this asset is configured um, has differences, and the differences are what help it maintain its stability. Um, so, so let's walk through those. Um, the first is that this asset isn't supplied to the market. So if you think about borrowing some other asset, you know, if you deposit WETH and borrow wrapped Bitcoin, um, somebody else has to have deposited that wrapped Bitcoin in order, order for you to later borrow it. Um, in terms of Go, that's not required. When you deposit your wrapped ETH and borrow Go, nobody has to have deposited it instead the protocol reaches out to the Go uh, contract and mints that Go on demand. Um, same goes for when you repay. Uh, that Go is actually burned rather than going back to the suppliers. Um, the Oracle price is fixed to $1. So, uh, of course, other assets, the Oracle reports the actual market price so that the um, protocol knows, you know, how much value is this asset? How much can you borrow against it? You know, it, uh, maintaining that over collateralization. 
Um, in this case, Go is pegged to one USD, despite what the market price is. Um, so this helps maintain stability. Um, it creates arbitrage opportunities, say uh, the price is above $1 in the market. Um, when the protocol thinks it's just $1, you can mint a bunch of Go. Uh, you know, that is debt at the cost of a dollar. You can sell it at the market, say for a dollar and five cents. That increases supply, which should reduce the price. Um, and then eventually you can buy back that Go at one dollar, pay back your dollar debt, and you know, five cents on the dollar is arbitrage. Stability mechanism and difference in how this asset works is in its interest rates. Uh, normal assets, uh, the interest rates are based on the utilization of a pool. So you know, if you have 100 uh, tokens supplied and 10 of them borrowed, the interest rate will be relatively low. If you have 100 tokens supplied and 90 assets borrowed, the interest rate will be quite high. Um, in this case, there are no suppliers, um, so interest rates work differently. Um, to start, interest rates will be set by governance. Um, and again, this serves as a stability mechanism. Um, you can increase supply by reducing interest rates, um, and the inverse holds true as well. Um, another difference to highlight is that uh, interest that accrues on positions will be repaid uh, to the Aave governance. So rather than having to um, pay sp suppliers, um, because there are no suppliers, uh, that interest can be redirected. Um, some other differentiating factors for this token uh, is that discounts are available to users who stake Aave in the safety module. So um, you know, if governance has set the interest rate to 3%, by staking Aave, you can get some discount on that interest. Um, there's also multi-collateral positions. So you have the flexibility to um, use different assets as collateral within the same position. Um, this is different than DAI, uh, where you have a single vault. You have one collateral type. Um, so this introduces a little bit more flexibility for some use cases that might make sense where you know, if you need to re-up your collateral, you don't necessarily need to swap between assets um, to fund that position. And then thirdly, you can earn interest on these positions. So by supplying your collateral to the Aave protocol, um, other users will be borrowing it and you'll earn interest on that, which effectively reduces the interest that you're paying uh, on your borrowed positions. We highlighted, and a lot of the earlier part of this talk was around risks, right? So let's talk through what are the risks here and how are they mitigated in the Aave market? Um, so collateral asset risk. Um, the Aave protocol has a pretty strong history of being relatively conservative and effective in managing the assets that are used for collateral and you know, setting the configurations around those. So making sure you have safe uh, over collateralization ratios Etc. Um, similar goes to the fr flash crash risk. Um, you know, this risk exists, um, but we've seen that the Aave protocol is um, a relatively resilient market uh, that has gone through pretty turbulent uh, times already. Again, protocol configuration is pretty similar to collateral asset risk, where um, you know, we work with the DAO, the DAO works with Gauntlet, um, and you know, it was relatively conservative. Um, there's the smart contract risks and stability mechanisms. I, I think we've covered those enough. Um, so when go, uh, soon TM. Um, there's a few dependencies in governance right now, including deploying the V3 market, um, whether we'll be upgrading the V2 market in place um, or deploying a new market for V3. Um, so there's some dependencies around that, um, which will, uh, as soon as those are done, we'll, move, we'll look to move forward with Go. And Go's future, um, you know, we're hopeful that uh, we can move Go to L2s. Um, I th we think there's a really large opportunity there with lower fees um, to you know, have this as a token that's used widely, both by crypto native users and um, you know, more of the general population. Um, another interesting functionality is that we have facilitators. So, um, Go, Aave is the first facilitator of Go, um, which means that they have permission to mint um, more Go. And in the future, 
Ave <laughs> governance, I'm getting the times up, I'll to talk fast. Uh, Ave governance can add additional facilitators which will have the, the ability to uh, mint Go uh, if they are approved. So obviously there's a lot that goes into that, a lot of reviewing, I think that will probably be more long term, um, but something cool to look forward to. Uh, and that's it, thank you guys.